Today on this episode of The Brain Surgeon's Take, we will be discussing diet and cancer. Is sugar toxic? With cancer metabolism pioneer and Harvard professor, Dr. Lewis Cantley. Learn why cancer at its origin is a metabolic disease and how what you eat and drink, including sugar, may increase inflammation and foster malignancies. Much more on this podcast episode. Welcome back, everyone. Here's my take on Lewis Cantley. He is a medical pioneer who is changing the face of cancer. As a professor of cell biology at Harvard Medical School and previous director of the clinical cancer program at Cornell, Dr. Cantley is accustomed to leadership roles and pushing the boundaries of science. This was never more evident than when his laboratory discovered the PI3 kinase pathway that is critical in insulin signaling and cancer. I loved this interview discussing the role of diet and cancer. There is now strong evidence to suggest that what we eat and drink, especially sugar, not only impacts our metabolism, but also elevates inflammation and potentially increases the risk of malignancies. The more we learn, the more obvious it becomes that we need to better educate Americans on the importance of nutrition. What you put in your body definitely has implications and we need to make wellness a priority in this country. In short, you are what you eat. Listen up as we discuss diet and cancer. Is sugar toxic? Check it out. All right. Hey, Lou, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. Listen, thanks for joining us today and talking about such an interesting topic about the role of diet and cancer and is sugar toxic? So I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say since you're such an expert in the field. Um, I guess let's start with basics about what is the definition of cancer? So cancers, uh, we now know, are all a consequence of mutational events, either in a family of genes called oncogenes, or which means cancer genes, quite literally, or in a, and these are gain-of-function mutations, mutations that make that the protein encoded by that gene either more highly expressed or more active. And uh, the other family of genes that are mutated are called tumor suppressor genes. And these are loss of function mutations. So you can get cancers either way by losing one of the repressors of cell growth or gain of function in one of the activators of cell growth. And in many cases, both happen in the same tumor. So I guess the question is, diet and cancer, what's the relationship between the two and, and what do we know about how they interact? So we know that there are certain cancers where diet obesity certainly strongly correlates. Pancreatic cancers, for example, uh, typically are higher risk for people who have uh, obesity. Um, and that, it's not true of all cancers. And of course, as People do get cancers, for example, lung cancer. They tend to lose weight rather than gain weight. And so there it's, as we know, caused primarily by smoking. So they're different, uh, different cancers correlate with obesity or not. And what, I guess, I guess the, that, that the next question would be, why does obesity correlate with certain cancers? What's the, what's the proposed mechanism? So I would propose that the mechanism is all through an enzyme that my laboratory discovered called PI3K. Uh, that stands for phosphoinositide 3 kinase. So this is an enzyme that creates a lipid, and that lipid will drive growth of cells by signaling pathways that are we, we now understand in some detail. Uh, so my, my laboratory discovered these pathways many years ago, the enzyme PI3K itself, it's downstream uh, protein kinase that, that gets activated uh, as a consequence of PI3K activation called AKT. AKT itself is an oncogene that can get mutated and drive cancer. So almost every step in that pathway plays a role in cancer. And what about, so we talked about obesity the enzyme pathways, inflammation. Are there certain types of foods that have been shown to increase or decrease the risk of cancer? Yes, uh, absolutely. High carbo 
rapid release carbohydrate is a very high risk. Now, it turns out that this pathway that I just mentioned, the PI3K pathway, what it does is uh, take glucose out of the bloodstream and put it into cells. And so you need that, of course, in order to grow. And insulin will stimulate that process. So you need insulin to grow. Uh, type 1 diabetics, for example, who are diagnosed as children because they can't make insulin, uh, their first evidence that they have a problem is failure to thrive. They can't put on weight. They don't grow as fast. So insulin is itself a growth hormone during development. In adults, it, of course, doesn't continue to stimulate growth, although the truth is if you have high insulin, you will grow, but not taller, just fatter. So you can put on fat uh, by high, having high levels of insulin signaling. Uh, but throughout growth, you know, throughout development, insulin is what makes, our, makes us grow. Uh, as adults, its primary function is just to keep glucose levels normal in cells. So type 2 diabetics, which is now you know, probably 50% of Americans over the age of 50 have some level of insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, is a consequence of overeating, and overeating in particularly rapid release carbohydrates. And they are what ultimately cause this insulin resistance. So the rapid release carbohydrates, you're not talking about complex carbohydrates, obviously, not like sweet potatoes or baked potatoes. You're talking about sugars, rice, very simple carbohydrates that kind of spike your insulin and then it crashes. That's correct. So anything that makes your glucose levels of rice rapidly will also make insulin uh, secretion occur very rapidly as well. So these high persistent high levels of insulin can lead to other risks, not only obesity, but also cancer. Yeah, you know, it seems like the more we learn about sugar, the more we learn about how toxic it is to our body. So just so all of our listeners understand, when you, how is sugar toxic? And the mechanism is you, you basically take in sugar, your insulin spikes and go from there. When the insulin spikes, how does that increase the risk of cancer? So insulin, is, as I say, during development, it is what makes our cells grow. Once we're adults, if you have high levels of insulin, you continue to grow, but you just grow by adding fat, not, not by adding muscle, not by growing taller, not by increasing the size of your bones, but just adding fat to your body. Now, historically, you might ask, well, why... Why did humans develop this ability to continue to gain weight as adults? Is there any advantage to that? And I would argue, yes, 100,000 years ago, you were far more likely to die of starvation than obesity and cancer. And so being able to put on weight when food was available uh, was very important. So we have, a, we have the ability when particularly rapid release carbohydrate is available uh, and I, I would say that, you know, 100,000 years ago, that would be something like honey that you would rob from the bees. That's the only time you would get that kind of rapid release carbohydrate. But by putting on weight when fruits and honey are available, which is a relatively short period of time of the year, allows you to survive during the, the lean times when mm -hmm. there's nothing to eat. So anyone who didn't put on a lot, a lot of fat was likely to die of starvation in the springtime when there was virtually no food available. So I would argue that's why we evolved the desire to eat sugars, rapid release carbohydrates that make us overweight uh, because it, it allowed us to survive. So sugar in and of itself is not, is not cancer causing, but it causes you have an insulin spike, gain weight, become obese, and then from there, the obesity, from my understanding, leads to increased inflammation in the body. And inflammation is ultimately what leads to cancer risk. Is that is that the appropriate step? It, it, that's certainly part of it, yes. Uh, I would say the very act of having high insulin will drive the growth of cancer cell directly. And the reason for that is because of this gene that my lab discovered, PI3K, uh, stands for phosphoinositide 3 kinase. That enzyme 
is directly activated by insulin uh, and it mediates everything insulin does. So it helps you control your glucose levels, et cetera. But during, de during development, that is the, the enzyme that uh, responds to insulin to tell your cells to grow. If you don't have that enzyme, uh, then you that children who, these are rare events, but they have, you know, they fail to thrive. And if you have overactivation of that enzyme, then you get in a particular tissue. So this can happen during development when tissue has uh, a mutated form or overexpressed form of PI3K, and that cell then grows out of control. So you have localized hypertrophy, if you're uh, it, it, usually a vascular cell uh, grows out of control. So those are rare events, but they do occur and they're treated with the same drugs that we treat cancer patients that block the PI3K and therefore bring the patients back into normal blood vessels again. So it's actually a very effective treatment for those for those children. So, so sugar is carcinogenic by multiple mechanisms. Number one is the insulin spike, like you're saying, a direct, you know, increase in cancer risk. And on top of that, leads to obesity, which leads to inflammation, which by a separate pathway is also a higher risk for cancer. So it's kind of a double whammy when it comes to there's, sugar. It's a triple whammy, if you will, because there's also something that happens in the intestine. So when you eat sugar, uh, it can, it will, in fact, we've shown in mouse models, and we see this in patients as well, uh, make the villi in your intestine grow longer. So that, and this occurs by a relatively surprising mechanism where the sugar that's being absorbed as it goes through your intestine uh, is um, is absorbed by these so-called tip cells that are uh, extracting the food from you know from your intestine as it goes through the intestine, and they just get longer. Uh, they use that sugar that's that they're exposed to directly to grow locally rather than it getting into the bloodstream and generally affecting insulin it's actually directly acting on those cells and they get longer and once they get longer they absorb absorb more food so even over the next two or three months after having been exposed to a very high sugary diet then anything you eat will, will get absorbed into your food into your body much more efficiently wow so so there's a long-term effect of eating that sugar in making you gain weight even after you quit eating the sugar because the tip cells are longer. So that makes sense when people, that's why it's so hard to lose weight as an adult. When you've been eating poorly for years and years and even decades, you go on a diet, but your body is still absorbing calories at a higher rate than someone else who hasn't been eating like that. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. And people you know, complain about that. They say, well, you know, I go on the same diet as this person, but I'm not losing weight. And, and it's they're true. It's correct because those tip cells are allowing them to extract a greater amount of calories from the food they eat. Do those tip cells go back to a regular size if you're on a different diet over time? Yes, eventually they will. I can't remember the exact time, but uh, we certainly did that in mice and it, it takes a, a few months Wow. Yeah. And I, I yeah, most people, most people after a couple of weeks of a diet not working, just give up as opposed to realizing your body's got to adapt. Yeah, that's, that's correct. It's going to take several months to come back to a normal food absorption again. Now, is the evidence strong enough to call sugar a carcinogen? Would you go that far and say that, look, the evidence is such that between the insulin and the tip cells and the inflammation, and the obesity, sugar is a carcinogen? I wouldn't call it a carcinogen because I, the very phenotype that I just described is what allowed us to survive, you know, at times when there wasn't a whole lot to eat, that being able to adjust your intestines to absorb more food when less food is available is what keeps you alive. So I wouldn't call it a carcinogen. I would call it a, uh, well, I'm just calling it an adaptive mechanism for survival that under times of abundant food can actually be detrimental to you. Interesting. 
And, you know, just so people have an idea, everyone knows what sugar is, but you're talking about rapid release carbohydrates. Give us two or three examples of what exact foods you're talking about that people should try to avoid. Well, I would say anything that has, obviously sugar is the first thing. And, and by sugar, we mean two types of sugar. There's cane sugar, which is a a, a covalent dimer of fructose and glucose. It's exactly 50-50 fructose glucose. That's called sucrose. Uh, and then there's high fructose corn syrup, which you hear about all the time. It's on the labels of foods and so forth. Uh, and that's a synthetic form of, uh, of fructose. It's uh, of sugar which, where you mix pure fructose with pure glucose and come up with a non-covalent mixture of the two. And it's about 60% fructose. It can vary from food to food. Uh, but that's typically what's put in most commercial foods. You, I mean, if you buy candies or... Um, or any kind of preserved foods that are bought commercially, uh, they roughly they what they've done is they take teenage boys, put them in a room, and they give them the ratio of glucose to fructose, and ask them what do you like best, and they came up with sixty percent fructose to glucose, and that's what was put in all commercialized right. foods. Yeah, and when you talk about you know sh sugars and the different corn syrups and fructose out there, obviously the biggest problem would be kids food right kids foods are typically drowning in sugar whether it's cereal or you know desserts or chocolates what should parents do in order to raise their kid healthy if nearly all children's foods have sugar so i would get, not give them any processed foods i i try when i raised my daughters we virtually never gave them processed foods uh even orange juice you know we think of orange juice is a very healthy thing and yes in small amounts it is but it also has high, high rapidly released carbohydrate. It's a lot of sugar in it. Uh, and certainly any drink that has sugar added to it, we try to avoid altogether. I would say, you know, diet drinks came along that have no sugar in them. But the problem with eating, drinking diet drinks, what I noticed with, with my friends and colleagues when I was growing up, is that in the end of the day, they had to have the real thing. So you eat diet drinks all day long. And they're, they're, you don't get any sugar from them, but you're getting the taste of sugar. And so you, they crave to get that, that sugar rush. So at the end of the day, they have to eat like a half gallon of ice cream to be able to go to sleep because of this craving that's been driven by the artificial sugar. Yeah, and I think you put it best, right? It's everyone's like, oh, well, a kid can eat anything and he's not going to put on weight, which is usually true. But then you learn bad habits and then you become an adult and then you can't eat anything you want. And then it's really difficult to change your habits about eating not processed foods and no sugar and organic and what have you. So um, I agree with you that if you can teach your kids how to eat relatively healthy early on, it really pays dividends uh, later on. You know, we talked about how sugar and, and, and carbohydrates are cancer risks, but now let's shift a little bit and talk about once someone has a diagnosis of cancer, um, does sugar and carbohydrates, do those play a role in cancer spread as well? Yes, I would say they do. Uh, certainly in our mouse models, we can see that the diet we put the mice on, if it has a lot of sugar in it, will raise insulin levels. The mutations that occur in cancers very often involve the insulin signaling pathway. So, and, an enzyme that my lab discovered called PI3K, phospholinositide 3 kinase, is directly activated by insulin. And it mediates in the cell interior, everything that insulin does to control cell growth and survival, et cetera, is done by activating that enzyme. And that enzyme is one of the most frequently mutated genes in cancer. And the mutations are gain of function mutations. They make it respond to insulin better than the wild type enzyme, the normal enzyme does. And so that's uh, drugs that directly target that enzyme have been approved for treating cancer. Uh, and th the problem is, of course, that if you turn off the enzyme that mediates everything insulin does, 
then you become acutely insulin resistant. So you're trying to treat the cancer with a drug that if it also hits the PI3K and all of your normal tissues, you become insulin resistant. So that's that can be a problem to deal with. The, the drugs have been approved, but they're not ideal. Uh, the goal now is to get drugs that only hit the mutant forms of that enzyme that you see in cancer and don't hit the normal enzyme and then you don't become insulin resistant and you can kill the tumors. And that such drugs are now in development and they look very promising. Yeah, I mean, now that we understand how the cancer cells work and how they get their energy, are, can doctors starve cancer cells, which is basically what you're talking about? Is there a specific diet that cancer patients should be on? Yes, certainly. I would argue that if if one is diagnosed with cancer, if I were diagnosed with cancer, I would tell you I would be on a ketogenic diet the next day. So what is a ketogenic diet? It's a diet that induces ketones. Uh, but the reason the ketones are induced is because there's so little carbohydrate in the diet that your body, your liver begins converting fat into ketones which can do the same thing as glucose in your bloodstream. They can go to other cells and provide energy. Uh, even your brain can survive on ketones with very little carbohydrate. So you can get down to very little carbohydrate in your bloodstream uh, because the ketones will replace it. But that requires a diet that's only about 8% carbohydrate. And the rest is fat, mainly fat and, and some amount of protein. Uh, so you think, well, if you eat a diet that's you know 80% fat, you're going to get fat. Well, the truth is, no. <laughs> we put mice on an 80% fat diet, they lose weight uh, because of this complex mechanism by which insulin controls how your body grows. And if your glucose is low, your insulin stays low, and you don't gain weight. So uh, is there any data so far to show ketogenic diet in cancer patients improves overall survival or time to recurrence? So we are currently conducting clinical trials. Uh, by we, I actually mean the team I put together at Wild Cornell before I moved back to, to Boston and now at Dana-Farber. Uh, but uh, Marcus Goncalves, a former postdoc in my laboratory, who's an MD, PhD, is medical practices in endocrinology, not cancer. But because he understands in great detail what I just explained, and has done published some important papers in that area, uh, he's running a clinical trial uh, it, that involves multiple institutions in New York City uh, that uh, has a ketogenic arm to the, to the uh, dietary intervention. So the patients have that are enrolled in the trial have mutations either in PI3K or P10, the phosphatase that uh, uh, reverses what PI3K does. And uh, they go on, uh, they have several alternative ways to keep their glucose levels low while taking a PI3K inhibitor. But one is a dietary intervention. Uh, the other is a, a drug that causes your kidney to secrete glucose into the bladder, into the urine. And that uh, is called the SGLT2 inhibitor, sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor. So you block that and the glucose, as it gets filtered in your kidney, ends up all in the bladder. And so you get rid of your glucose and that keeps glucose down. So either dietary intervention uh, or the SGLT2 inhibitor are very effective ways of keeping glucose down while taking the PI3K inhibitor. And it makes the drugs in our preclinical studies dramatically more effective at killing the cancer without causing this complication of insulin resistance. In your opinion, what is the most promising translational anti-cancer therapy uh, that you know about? It, would it be what you just mentioned or is there another key development that's going on? Well, it, in regard to, I, I can only really comment on cancers that have the PI3K mutation or P10 loss, either one of those. 
causes a problem with uh, with having uh, hyper responses to insulin. So in, in those subsets of cancers, which dominate endometrial cancer and breast cancer, so something like 70%, 70-80% of women with endometrial or breast cancer have something wrong with that signaling pathway. It's hyperactivated. That's what's driving their tumor. So putting these women on these dietary interventions along with the PI3K inhibitor makes it work dramatically better. And uh, we're excited about uh, the outcomes of that clinical trial. Now, I, would you say that it's that most Americans do not understand how important the relationship between diet and health and particularly diet and cancer is? I would say that myself being a doctor, I know about it, but I would say the average American doesn't understand that you know, being obese is not about cosmetics. It's also a cancer risk. Do you feel like we need to better educate the public as to the importance and the relationship between diet and cancer? Yes, absolutely. I think it's it's critical to do. I, I myself, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I hope this gets to the audience uh, that needs to know this problem. Uh, I've been talking about this for probably 15 or 20 years. I was on 60 Minutes, uh, Sanjay Gupta many years ago, and talking about the same idea. But this is not a novel idea. We've known this for many years. Uh, so I do everything possible to get the word out that uh, we need to uh, think dramatically. We need to be much more serious about dietary intervention, both to prevent cancer and also to improve responses to cancer, anti-cancer drugs. Yeah, I mean, I think that's well said. I think everyone knows smoking leads to lung cancer, sun leads to melanoma, you know, tobacco can lead to throat cancer, but people don't really understand that carbohydrates, sugar, obesity, all of that increases oncogenesis overall. And so I think that it is a very important message and I'm glad that you're spreading it. Um, you know, last question, because I know you're super busy. Give us your crystal ball view. What major advancements do you see in cancer care over the next 10, 20 years? Well, I, I think that uh, particularly in my field, I'm very excited about the drugs that are being developed that hit only the mutant form of PI3K. And even though the PI3K inhibitors that have been approved that hit both the wild type and the mutant have been, they've been approved because they've been shown to extend life, uh, but for drugs that are now currently going into clinical trials that hit only the mutant form of PI3K and not the wild type, at least in preclinical studies, they are miracle drugs. They really knock out the tumor. You don't get this insulin elevation, and uh, which is feedback and keeping the tumor alive. So uh, those I'm very excited about uh, in, in my specific field. Of course, that's a relatively narrow field. I think the other area that might, we're beginning to see some progress in is in KRAS mutant tumors. Those are even, depending on the disease type, the, the tissue of origin, KRAS can be more frequently mutated than PI3K. And they both turn on similar pathways. In fact, they, have, they work cooperatively. Uh, but drugs now that hit mutant KRAS are being developed and uh, they're harder to make than the PI3K inhibitors, but uh, they're beginning to look promising as well. So I'm, I'm very excited about that progress in that area. Well, listen, Lou, uh, what a tremendous interview. The work you do is so groundbreaking. I'm glad that we're spreading the word and, and the information. And just like we talked about, I feel like people need to realize that what you put in your body makes a dramatic difference on your health. It's not about just how you look. It's about how you feel and your overall health. And I think the more we learn about how sugar and carbohydrates, uh, especially in large quantities, can not only lead to obesity, but like you said, it's a real triple whammy. Uh, people need to think about what they're feeding their kids and feeding themselves and, and, and having more organic, less processed foods. I think it's absolutely critical. So thanks for all you do. It's such an amazing message. And again, kudos to all of your lab with, those, with all those great discoveries. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, a pleasure to be able to talk to you and get the message out. So thank you.
All right, Lou. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. 